sweaty and like push, kind of push repulsive. In the so. bush. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. <laughs> It's no, no. one fucking hour time. Uh, I am Evan Husney, and of course, this is the show where we talk about one movie for one fucking hour. And we got to my left, who is here as always. We got Tom Fitzgerald, Big T. What's going on, man? How are you? Oh, Big T's doing good. I'm looking forward <laughs> to this movie. We're, uh, you know, we're continuing to keep we're moving around out of the glut that we've been in, uh, late '70s, early '80s. So bring on 2002. Yeah, let's do it. And, of course, we have uh, Mr. Marcus Herring with us as well. What's going on, man? How are you? What's up, guys? Doing good. Very excited to be here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And welcome back to the show. I think it's your... Is, is this your third appearance? I think it's your third appearance on the show. Of course, my good friend of 15 plus years now, we have Mr. <laughs> Joey Izzo. What's going on, Joey? Hello. What's up, gang? Nice Joey, to be yo, yo, yo. Welcome back, my man. man. Joey. Welcome Joey. back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, all right, I'm excited for this. Uh, this is some, this is still something a little different for us. I feel like in in a lot of ways uh, mm-hmm. uh, tonight's episode, uh, of course, which is episode 59, and we're going to be talking about Spike Jones and Charlie Kaufman's adaptation from 2002. So, uh, should we start the clock? Is there anything anybody wants to get in before I do this? Before I start it? No, start away. Good. We'll clock it up. Okay. All right, here we go. Here's the clock. And boom. All right. A little bit of backstory in this movie. I mean, this movie's pretty well known. Adaptation. You know, a lot of, a lot of folks have probably seen it who'll be, who be listening to this. Uh, so I'm just going to give a uh, quick overview. Um, so Adaptation, of course, is about Charlie Kaufman, who uh, faces his real life writer's block head on by creating a meta affront to the difficulties he experienced in translating Susan Orlean's book, The Orchid Thief. Using his own mind numbing experience, Kaufman lives vicariously through the representation of himself by Nicolas Cage and uses the blankness of the canvas to create his own piece of art. Um, Mm. All right, so... Joey, Marcus has talked about covering this movie on the show before. Uh, I mentioned it to you, Joey. You jumped at it. I uh, thought it'd be a good mm-hmm. one for you to bring on the show. But tell us your personal sort of backstory <laughs> with adaptation. Yeah. So it's one of those movies where I know exactly when and where I was. And I don't normally keep that kind of data stored. But it was January. But you'll kind of know why. It was January 11th, 2003. I saw it on a Saturday at 2 p.m. <laughs> It was raining. <laughs> I was driving a used Volvo that had probably around 50,000 miles. I've been and I in know Volvo. this because, yeah, well, there you go. Um, yeah. It's all facts. So I got pulled over on my way to see this movie uh, mm-hmm. uh, for us. I got in uh, for speeding and uh, and I was let go because it was my birthday, in fact. So I went to see this oh. movie. <laughs> On my birthday, and uh, and I was racing to 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 the theaters, and got pulled over on my way, and I went with this girl that I had a huge crush on at the time that really didn't kind of share those feelings. So it was a very dynamic <laughs> set and setting for this kind of movie, and right. uh, yeah, and then I and I we saw it, and I think I went back two days later. So that that moment of Sick. initially seeing it, it really struck me. And uh, I, But I hadn't seen it for maybe 10, 15 years. So revisiting it now, it was such a delight because, you know, it's been such a long time. Yeah, I honestly wasn't really sure what the revisit on this one was going to be like um, in terms of like how it would age. And, you know, I have sort of just to get my own personal business here with this movie is like, I have some mixed feelings on, you know, Charlie Kaufman after this movie um, and some definite mixed feelings with some of the collaborators he's worked with after this movie. Um, (laughs) And uh, uh, but Uh but I will say that um, adaptation for me, uh, man, it's it's a fun watch man it's it's it it definitely held up for me in a lot of ways it's very funny it's very clever and you know this is coming for me like 
out of a time like in the late 90s early 2000s where like clever was king you know in terms yes. of like what what really you know made an impression or a big splash was everyone i feel like trying to out clever themselves you know like with fight club <laughs> and twists yeah. and Shyamalan and everyone's yeah. like clever flexing here and there but this movie actually manages to be extremely quote unquote clever, but also uh, grounded and mean something and 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 have a great sense of humor too, you know. And it's not yeah. it's not this kind of you know rigid. There's nothing really cringy about it to me. And so I don't know. It it really it really held up for me. Um, and so I'll, I'll be excited to talk more about that. But I'm curious. Uh, let's go with Marcus. Marcus, what's your personal history with adaptation? Yeah, I'm, I'm stoked that we picked this one because I probably wouldn't have had the confidence to to throw it forward myself. So thanks, Joey, for <laughs> bringing it up. Because I, yeah. I, this movie is like comfort food for me. Yeah. I've seen it so many times that almost like when you brought it up, I know it so well that when you brought it up, I was kind of like, oh my god, what would I talk about? You know, it's like you know something too well almost. Yep. But um, I it's not really a typical movie that I would gravitate to. Although I did love being John Malkovich too. But um. Yeah, I was really I, I saw it around the time when it came out, but I was super checked out of culture at that time. But this, you know, from like 97 to 2007 or something like that, kind of my right. wilderness years, which I've alluded to before. But um, oh, yeah, <laughs> I think that, uh, you it's know, through, um, huh? this movie pierced through and I, I kind of half watched it at my sister's house. And I was like, it's kind of funny. I wasn't really paying attention. But then I remember turning to her and saying, like, after it was over, I was like, that was pretty good. I liked the first two thirds, but man, it got kind of like, got really Hollywood at the end there. You know? <laughs> like, I didn't get it the first time through. Oh, okay. I was just, you know, dumbass. So um, <laughs> I was kind of only half watching it, you know. And my sister kind of pointed out to me, like, you know, well, that's the whole thing. Anyway, we'll get into it later, but. Um, that's when it all kind of clicked for me. And I was like, oh my God, I feel like I almost watched it again right away, you know? And, um, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Anyway, it's like stoked to get into it more deeply. Yeah. Man. Right. For sure. T, how about you? Well, uh, you know, I'm like, I guess everybody else. I didn't even see it in a the theater, though, but um, I was big on John, being John Malkovich, like a lot of folks. And so I was like, hey, there's more from the same guys a couple years later. So I got into that and I wound up just catching it on cable, though. Uh, and um, it was on all the time for a while, maybe IFC channel or something. So mm -hmm. I watched it and I was, I was a big fan. I was really liking it a lot. And um, then I would kind of forget about it in like 10 year chunks. Yeah. And I kind of <laughs> only now have seen it again in about a decade. And I just got to say, I was rewatching it in a weird way today, briefly in a cafe. I decided to get some coffee. I'm watching it on my computer. And so I'm pausing occasionally with the headphones on. I'm pausing. So I'm hearing like, <laughs> McKee and 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 you know uh, talking to uh, Nicolas Cage about like screenwriting you know and uh, what the audiences want and expectations and there's nothing wrong with entertaining people anyway I pause and a couple had just watched like the whale oh. a few doors down at a movie theater and they're arguing so I'm hearing the movie and then I'm hearing arguing back and forth because I keep turning on and off the the, the, the audio and and she's to the point she's saying insane things that are so meta for this film it was like almost creepy and also i'm in an la cafe by the way <laughs> right right, right. So like, in the eh, what's going on like where and yeah. i almost was like are you seeing an adaptation on my screen and that got you guys make starting this conversation it was that kind of thing because <laughs> simply stated she was saying what's wrong with entertainment what's wrong with entertaining people now we just saw this movie why would a depressed person want to watch a depressed person on the big screen? They just want to see Top Gun. They want Tom Cruise. They want popcorn and excitement and fun. And he's like, that's not a movie. Movies are art. That's like watching a juggler, you know? And so they were having this back and forth that was an argument right out of the movie. And it was, uh, of course, of all movies to get super meta in reality, it was this one. And uh, it was... Uh, it was kind of strange. It was, it was uh, beautiful. Man. <laughs> so that was my the, little moment today. With oh, my God. The whale. Holy shit. Uh, I know. And I'm maybe, all movies, right? maybe there's some... I don't, I don't know. Hit us in the comments if you think there's an appetite out there for a one fucking hour in the whale. Uh, there might appetite. be. Appetite. <laughs> masturbation. <laughs> Is that intentional? Oh, yeah. No, was, of course it was. Well, this um, movie's got three masturbation scenes. Exactly. Right, I was going to so. say. <laughs> it does. Rolls in both movies. <laughs> yes, masturbation sure. scenes. They're, yeah, they're, they're so. some of the best. There are keep some of the best. for Donald to come for each one. <laughs> yeah. Talk exactly. about uh, the last act. Uh, yeah. Okay. So... 
<laughs> well, let's let's just get right in here. Um, so obviously, we were talking about at the beginning that this is a meta story. It's obviously about you know Charlie Kaufman's real life struggle to adapt this book, The Orchid Thief, which is about a based on a New Yorker story by Susan Orlean. Um, she met this really interesting eccentric guy named John LaRoche who was uh, cooking up this scheme in order to sort of harvest these rare orchids by using indigenous people local to the area to get around some weird nature laws they had there. Um, And she just was enraptured by this guy because he's just a kooky character. And so she wrote this piece and then of course it it got uh, optioned for a book and then the book got optioned for a movie. And then somehow in 1997, 20th Century Fox buys the rights to the book. And uh, a year later, 1998, kind of in the middle of making uh, being John Malkovich, uh, Charlie Kaufman is hired to write the script. As we see in adaptation, Right, a, a reconstruction of the set of being John Malkovich. <laughs> yeah, but with, yeah. with killer uh, fake. Uh, but with two killer Nicholas fake pages. Out. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, it's shot on DV. Yeah. yeah, it's like that's the opening of the movie. It's like let's start with some fake In- BTS incredible. footage of the movie previously. <laughs> Ponytailed, um, Cusack. Yeah, yeah. Shit was it's, shit. It's amazing. And like the it DP kind of, yeah. is playing himself, but is also shooting the very movie that you're watching. Oh yeah. My God. Anyway. Yeah, it's really but amazing. Yeah. And d- does also, ha- there there are some echoes, traces there of Nathan Fielder's The Rehearsal, just a little <laughs> I was in totally the idea. That. Yeah. You know, yes. of. Yes. I think anytime I see the back of a theater flat, that's what I'm going to think of from now on. But anyway, yeah. um, so anyway, so 1998, Charlie Kaufman's hired to write the script. Interestingly enough, with Jonathan Demi attached to direct. Um, which is like, oh, that, that would have been, producer. that would, yeah, exactly. And that would have been a different fucking movie right there. <laughs> um, yeah. Snooze. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, Go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say like Spike really balances out Kaufman. I think, oh, the, mm-hmm. you know, the great one team. of the major Perfect great said, takeaways, yes, yes, yes. you know, I think like, uh, he's, he's done other collaborations. I don't think his like human nature with Michelle Gondry was like I didn't even see it. Looks doesn't look so good. Oh, I don't it looks know. rough. Yeah. Um, <sighs> Eternal Sunshine got like you know a bunch of awards and stuff, but I just don't think it holds up. And for a number comparatively, of comparatively, no. I I think it's yeah. rewarding though. But you know whatever. Yeah, it's got its moments. But it's not for these sure. first two. Yeah. I think with, here's uh, what I think. Yeah. Spike and Chuck. I think Charlie. that Charlie Kaufman, I guess this is alluding to what I was saying earlier, Charlie Kaufman does have some real ass shit to say and some real ass shit to explore. You know, I think the questions he's an- asking and and the, and the themes that he's exploring are real and they're important and, you know, he's sincere with those, right? But, yeah. you know, Spike does such a good job of elevating that material um so well and so tastefully and also i think what i appreciate joey and i were talking off air about this about how like adaptation still i think holds up because it's grounded you know it's a it's a meta film that takes you in these crazy ride of different areas and explores all this different shit there's different timelines hitting you all the different you know all over the place but it's three years later yeah, Three yeah, exactly. Ago. Nine <laughs> years back, but it's it's on the ground. A million still. years ago. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. It opens with the origin of all life on Earth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's my fun. favorite yeah, desperate I, um, uh, <laughs> manic moment in movies. Oh, it's so good. It's a great yeah. idea into the microphone, and it's just awful. And he's like, yeah. it's like, and monkeys. And then the monkeys start using yeah. tools. And yeah. it's like, well, his reaction later, when he's listening back to it. Right. And he's incredible. Himself going, Mark, <laughs> side note. Incredible. Brilliant. Yeah. It's, it is brilliant. It is brilliant. It is brilliant. But yeah. see, but, but hey, but that's what makes it great is that scene right there, that reaction of him listening to it back. The, mm-hmm. It's all grounded. It's not like a meta movie. And I don't mean right. to use this as an yeah. opportunity to shit on everything everywhere all at once, but that movie <laughs> is just is just noise hitting you at all it. directions and it's actually unwatchable mm-hmm. in my opinion. And 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 it's like this what Spike and Charlie create, I think, you know, really works. But going on with Gondry, yeah. you have like the sort of twee cringe vibes that come in. And it's like that. That's just I don't like that combo. But go on. What were you going to say? Fair. Yeah. You it, mentioned Clever being like, you know, this was a clever era. Memento, all those movies. Yep. And like yeah. uh, out at the same time. And, and Clever yeah. can be really yeah. grating, you know, especially in, in hindsight. I feel like after mm. you know the. After you know the twist, you know, M. Night Shyamalan and Ding Dong, like you're like, after you know the twist to his movies, it's a lot less interesting, right? So um, this movie, like, 
you know, like he really, uh, well, there's a few things going on. There's the collaboration with those guys, but also he like, it's got sort of a planned rewatch ability to it. You know, that's like, mm-hmm. it's more enriching on rewatches, but um, it, I think like the, the collaboration with, with Spike is so vital and as you see that with uh, Synecdoche, you know, when caught, when like they Oof. split, like mm-hmm. uh, Spike yeah, was supposed to be a part of that. You oh, know, he was. But, um, mm-hmm. but then he left to go do something else. And, and so Charlie ended up doing the directing it. Mm-hmm. But it is almost like the movie that Robert McKee tells Charlie not to make. Do you know what huh. I mean? He's like, you're going right. to bore your audience to <laughs> tears. You know, it's like, it's almost, it's, it's so weird how this movie. Why uh, the fuck did you waste three hours of my life? <laughs> Why am I watching your That's movie? Yeah. 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 It's like three it's hours, like, isn't it? Well, it's funny because like the, the, the central like question it. of this movie is like, can you make a movie about flowers? Can you make a movie about nothing? And then this movie sets out, kind of answers that question in a way, right? That like, like, you know, you just, you have to make a Hollywood movie that they have to have some Hollywood elements that, that people will enjoy in it. And Synecdoche is like the movie about flowers, you know, which is some interesting things in it and says a lot yeah. of deep yeah. stuff. There is some interesting stuff in it. Yeah. I never want to watch it ever again, though. It's so heavy, yeah. you know, it makes me yeah. depressed. But, um, wait, anyway, which one? Well, oh, Schenectady. Schenectady. Right. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. It's too long. Well, getting back just to the thread real fast um, on this so we can dive in. So just, you know, obviously it goes without saying you've seen an adaptation, you know what happens. Basically, Charlie Kaufman is having a difficult time adapting this book literally. So he, you know, uh, about well into the process, he comes up with the idea to make it uh, meta and about himself trying to adapt um, the story. But what was great about it, and, and, you know, I think Spike Jones was someone who was really championing him to push to keep going in that direction with how he was writing that. Um, but for me, what's amazing is this introduction, and if we can... Um, is in the movie is this is this creation of his twin brother his doppelganger the other side <laughs> of the donald coin ganger. donald <laughs> ganger is donald kaufman and um and i mean yeah god dude well just to interject here before we go on donnie to get, catch everyone up to speed at yeah. this like pre donald every other character that you see in adaptation is based on a real life proxy so the agent yeah, right. is named after uh charlie's actual agent and everybody right. has signed on for this strange meta commentary movie at the you know and then well, the fictional element well i mean no ex- no one ex- signed I guess, on I guess not uh well i guess i mean in the sense that he is writing all of these things on a non-fictional kind of basis like enfolding right. all these things in and then the one f- flight of fancy that is created initially mm-hmm. is my twin brother, right. Donald. Yeah. Uh, He's so visiting. Over, <laughs> yeah. 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 He's yeah. Staying yeah. with me. Right. It's like everything's yeah, which, real, but this no, huge I, I know, yeah, thing. No, totally. That's a great <laughs> point. It's like, it's like, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a representational painting, except there's a giraffe in the barn. Exactly. You know, so, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Well, what's what's awesome about Donald is that it's like lit, like just like you said, Joey. It's like you know the actual executive who optioned the rights to the book is in the movie. His agent is in the movie. You know, all the but being John Malkovich, people are in the movie, except for the twin is the only real artificial element. And yeah. what's what's amazing is that he utilizes Donald to be this person to kind of like shit on all the formulaic tropes of movie making you know like he gets to have that Mm -hmm. character in it but what's interesting i was curious is how he arrived at that idea how did he arrive at the idea to to have this character in the movie and i just dug a little bit and found a rare interview with charlie and he basically mentions that the challenge he had in writing this was if he's doing the character of himself you know of charlie kaufman yes that this guy, you know, he, he, this character, him, doesn't have any friends or real social life in the script. Yes. So there's nothing dramatic about someone with no friends or social life, right? Who's totally so he, alone and isolated. Yeah, exactly. So, so he decides to make sort of not only just with a meta, you know, criticism of cringe Hollywood tropes by creating the twin mm-hmm. character, but he also it just it was giving that character somebody to talk to, and it was That's a what great I was way thinking. to. 
Yeah. Because yeah. more, it, especially in the later part, just one little thing is I, it felt like uh, it is someone just talking to themselves, especially in like the hotel sure. scenes later. So Ooh. yeah, I mean, you, there's a reading of it where it is like sort of an externalized version of his own inner conflict, right? I mean, in the fact that the yeah. the movie that the brother is writing is about multiple personalities, the three, and, and he addresses that. You know, uh, Charlie says the only thing more overused than serial killers is multiple personalities <laughs> which is like a critique of the three but also i think sort of a almost like you know donald and charlie could be multiple personalities too and like sure the screenplay yeah. is actually isn't it actually the credits come up and it says written by yeah, yeah. Billy and donald kaufman yep. so right. yeah and famously donald israel actually and, i can't believe the writers <laughs> guild actually let them do that well yeah, i was just gonna say that it, it's like amazing that the introduction of donald is actually solving a universal an age-old problem with any any story dealing with a writer you know it's like well how do you mm. make that interesting you know right. when they're locked at their computer or or a uh, typewriter Rest, you know, creative really wrestling with the with the uh, with the blank page yeah, yeah. and yeah. then his solution is both like uh, very novel and interesting but it also you know kind of folds into this like dynamic and dialectic that he's having with conventional mainstream uh, kind of ideas right. and original artistry, you know, so it's kind of a, an amazing all throughout. I mean, this statement could kind of echo through anything said, but the duality of meaning going on throughout the movie, is it a good scene? Is the last, you know, is the last third good or is it, or is it bad? Like it is both mm -hmm. at the same time. And it's amazing how interwoven the, that kind of dualism is at like, even at the uh, invention of a character stage. You know what I mean? Totally. And um, the one thing that like is interesting, um, like you, you were mentioning how uh, Donald uh, is credited on the movie. And of course, famously, you know, that that gag, that gimmick would would kind of live on after the fact into the movie, yeah. because when this was on, when this film was on the awards circuit, you know, like th they were both nominated, you know, for for awards. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's a there, there, there's a great moment at the BAFTAs when like when like, you know, um, I think it was Renee Zellweger is like announcing that Charlie Kaufman and Donald Kaufman have won the BAFTA. And the BAFTA for adapted screenplay is awarded to adaptation, Charlie Kaufman and Donald Kaufman. You know, for best original screenplay or best adapted screenplay, excuse me. And um, but then she's like, well, unfortunately, you know, Charlie, nor Charlie, nor Donald could be here to accept the award. Unfortunately, neither Charlie nor Donald are here tonight, but. Um, oh, she's she unaware? <laughs> unaware. Has no oh, fucking idea. That, yeah. yeah. And it's just oh, amazing. Yeah, right on. Yeah. That's yeah. what's up. Yeah. So anyway, um, so anyway, yeah, it's just, it was just a, it's just a, it's just a crazy idea that totally works in this context of the movie. And as you were saying, like with, you know, Donald is then becoming a screenwriter, you know, Charlie's trying to, he's struggling to write this movie. Donald's struggling to write his serial killer <laughs> Hollywood movie, but literally every theme, as it's you were a saying, brain factory there. Yeah. And it's like he well, he's just he's he's trying to write the serial killer script, uh the three, which is so amazing, and every single oh trope and uh, like every single trope and theme that he's exploring in the serial killer movie is what's also being explored, you know, uh, and and is mirrored in the story of <laughs> adaptation, which is which mm -hmm. is nice. which is what makes it so great, you know, like that I I love that fact you know to it like even even so far as like there's that amazing scene when uh i think donald is saying to charlie he's talking about how like you know oh thanks for that idea it was very helpful i changed it a little now the killer cuts off body pieces and and makes his victims eat them it's kind of like caroline has this great tattoo of a snake swallowing its own tail and Uroboros. and then he's right. like the uroboros you know and when he says that i mean that's like Again, like a total metaphor for this entire well, movie. Well, well, the point, of, well, the point of that scene, the it ends with Charlie having a realization that his dumb brother, you know, clumsily falling backwards into that symbol, that symbol, right, mm -hmm. actually applies to what he has started doing by, um, you know, in, infusing himself, Charlie Kaufman, into the uh, the adaptation uh, right. of the Orchid book. <laughs> so, so it actually was a, had a profound thing that. Donald had stumbled on so that that's almost a perfect example of where this film's coming from that little moment 
you know. Yes, it, it always true. makes me smile that he wrote himself into this. The amount of like balls it takes to present this, you know, to present this script to you know, <laughs> yeah, Susan know. Orlean, and like she's like, I wrote myself into your book. Yeah. Your book's not right. good enough, you know. But then it's also balanced out by the fact that he presents right. himself in such he paints himself in such a bad light. You know, he's always yeah. you know, yeah. saying like we open on yeah. Charlie Coffin, pathetic, <laughs> disgusting, right. repellent. Yeah. Mumbling yeah, whereas, Fellini to himself. Is, whereas Fellini has cast himself as maybe the most handsome Italian right, man right. on planet Earth at right, that time right. and is whipping yeah. women and, and you know and it's eight like and this half, guy's yeah. like yeah. Dude, can we spend this a minute guy. on on the brother's hair? I mean, right after <laughs> that. Yeah. They lit it to make Charlie it as has thin as hair. possible. But I they lit it it's to be as thin as possible. Yeah, yeah. To like expose nice. how thin it really was. that is really an insane was. haircut. It's like, <laughs> yeah, let's see. My hair is thinning. Can I get a, a tight fro? <laughs> yeah. You know, a red yeah. tight fro? It's, it's wow. a great yeah. dog. And like the Good cat. Yeah. 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 It's kind of a, it's kind of weird that like he, he, he really made himself more repulsive than he, re, you know, he's not repulsive, but he made himself. Especially really, at yeah. that time, he was still very, he's, I mean, he's not, not that he's not now, but like, I mean, well, at that time, I think he was still he was relatively slender and like he wasn't that yeah, tall. Sure. You know? No, it's yeah, so no, funny totally. though. And he had like it's a beard. So it was complimenting yeah. his face kind of. No, but he made him look like, uh, you know, like uh, it was very unflattering. But let's actually maybe spend a minute on who played the brothers. Oh, you know? yeah. Nicholas Cage. Yes. And and I, I do want to say about, I, I do want to say about Nicholas Cage is it's like watching this movie, especially if you've seen it like two or three times or whatever, like if, with each new viewing, it's like another like meta layer that like Nicolas Cage is even playing this character. You know, the fact that we have a Holly recognizable Hollywood right. actor, you know, <laughs> yeah. portraying yeah. this is almost another layer onto itself, you know, and it it's, is. It, yeah, it's, absolutely. And he, yeah. first off, uh, does anybody know the answer to this? How the fuck did they land on Nick Cage? Does anybody know? Like, how did he I've, get this? I always off? sensed he was not the first choice. I, I don't know why it's a guess. Like he was yeah. the second or third. I don't know I why. I don't, I don't know. know. I know he was exactly. a he was a big, big fan of being John Malkovich. Okay. So oh. there's probably it probably came to that. You know, it was but his career was a little wobbly. I don't. He probably wasn't in big box office then, right? Like Bring Out Your Dead or something yeah. was happening. This is right? sort of like the second wave of Coming. his like four four act career or whatever. But I think <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. I don't know exactly. But you know, I think that like. Uh, it's like the Coppola connection. I'm pretty sure Spike was married to Sophia. You know. Oh yeah. And um, mm. that's how Spike got a hold of the script for being John Malkovich was through right. Francis got it, of course. and yep. then ended up giving it right. to um, right. to Spike because when they were still married. So Spike I, yeah. obviously knew Nicholas from that. I'd time, be curious you know. to see another actor uh, taking on the the brothers. Th though I don't know why. I mean, I like Nicholas Cage in general enough. Like I think. He's sort of funny to me, but I'm not amused by him. And like, I don't know, I I don't know how I feel it. about him. In, I think he's killing it. Oh, no, yeah. But he's he's good yeah. in this. But I am I, I would like to see someone else tackle it. I don't know why, because it I is slightly distracting for me because it's always going through a filter of that's Nicolas Cage's face, you know, and and his voice actually. That's what really. It's not a problem I'm having. I'm just saying like. It's it's another layer in this film to have to process everything through the voice of Nicolas Cage. Well, that's what you know, there's a lot of baggage there, you know. Well, that, that, but that's what I'm saying is kind of interesting about it. It's like a Hollywood, yeah. you know, it's another slice of the of the Hollywood commentary to me in yes. repeat viewings. But no, the, yeah, but yeah, yeah. I, and and I also read somewhere that Tom Hanks was at some point Dude. being circled for this, which no way. But I, oh my god, I, I, I my don't know at what stage in, though inside. I'm not Two sure what stage in so. one movie. <laughs> no, no, as, I'm not sure. With like, that haircut? No, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure if it was like okay, at the okay. point where you know, there was <laughs> okay. this meta script at all, though. I'm not sure. Um, oh, but I, I, this is a great yeah. performance from Nicholas, and like I think he pretty much right off the bat establishes that these these two guys look exactly the same, but he immediately delineates them with his performance mm -hmm. and Agreed. i think that yeah, that's good the, and donald is so goofy and charismatic and charming 
and Charlie is like, yeah, sweaty and like push, kind of push repulsive. Push in the so. bush. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Push, push in the bush. <laughs> that yeah, gets I mean, me every time. <laughs> it, it hits like a middle ground between Eddie Murphy throwing on every single yes. costume Hercules. and makeup thing to separate himself or like Jeremy Irons in Dead Ringers. That's like, yeah, I guess yeah. you're two different people. Sure. You know, like there's, yeah. it, yeah. it's probably right. the most convincing like double that I've ever hmm. seen really in a movie. I can't really hmm. even think and, of it. And, 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 Marcus and it speaks to saying, Marcus's point. Yeah. Like, yeah, the, the he didn't have any, he doesn't it's have like, showy. Donald doesn't have a beard, nope. you know, it's in the camera is pretty straightforward. It's just like, they're in a two shot. They obviously just and like they dress the double same. compose, split it, dress similar. It's like, but it's all conveyed through his like Mannerisms. performance and just yeah. treating it like, let's mm -hmm. do this like a drama, You're, you know, yeah, it's that again, is, that like epic. Yeah. Yeah. That is one of the things that makes this movie everlasting i think is like it's relies mainly on the performances and the screenplay obviously the screenplay mm. first then performances yeah. rather than like being like i'm a visual movie like gone yeah. michelle gondry is like more this is a music video mm, yeah. or something or yeah. no thanks a I lot agree. of times people rely on that kind of move on an indie movie like uh the everything everywhere all at once right oh. that's a visual movie oh. people just rely on that so this is like kind of gets back to more of a bad theatrical theater you yeah. know it's like good performances yeah. good writing that's like that's what's missing from like hollywood anyway you know it's like you've got the right marvel now. movies or whatever which you know like people i guess they're supposed to be dramatic or something but like it's like it's mainly <laughs> a visual feast right like 99 yes. percent of it is yeah yes. it's yeah. one percent well you know we're talking like about the meaning the, the brothers like the, yeah, go ahead. Well, what were you saying? Like the 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 uh, the 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 real grounding the film has in the dr dramatic and then in the acting chops of of Nicholas. But how about this? There's the you know it goes back and forth, and there's the great acting with Meryl Streep and Chris Cooper. Mm. And uh, I just wanted to start that part of the film too, because there's you know that actually is always my favorite part of the film actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, like yeah, I'm absolutely. really team yeah I'm really team Chris Cooper actually and. Um, talking about grounded, I mean that film doesn't have that part of the film. Excuse me, doesn't have any fantastical elements whatsoever, mm -hmm. really. In the first two acts, mm -hmm. you know, well, yeah. <laughs> and so you know, it's well, no, no. In the first two acts, it's like that is a guy in a fucking truck. The end. Hell yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And she's a reporter <laughs> yeah, from yeah. the New Yorker, you know, and that's yeah, it. Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. just saying, there's no Donald, you know, or anything like that. And so, yeah. and 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 which is one thing about Chris Cooper is that character. I don't know the guy at all. I haven't read the book, although I really kind of want to now. But you don't see blue the blue collar intellectual um, you know character yeah. very often. It's something that uh, Jack Nicholson has always championed that. And right, he, right. He right. always fancied himself so a true. blue collar intellectual. So true. Um, you know. Um, uh, you know, a Do you want a pizza, pizza? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's the iconic blue collar intellectual <laughs> catchphrase. Yeah. No, no. But anyway, so what I'm saying is just to the point. Uh, like this film gets. Um, there's like a whole other film, I guess I'm saying, in Florida. And Chris Cooper, the performance is so great. And, I, I, and I'm really touched by when she is touched by the, the pivot that happens in the film when she doesn't take him seriously and she's mocking his missing teeth to his asshole, you know, upper oh, east side, you know, love friends. Love that scene. You know, oh, my God. Yeah. Like, like, he has better blowjobs. Oh, he wears his sunglasses all a little dingle dangle around his neck. <laughs> I love it. Like, fuck you. Yeah. Like, fuck you. Yeah. This guy's a person. And it's that, that yeah. horrible. Hellish New Yorker type. Yeah, exactly. That literati. Kind of, you know, the have, literati. Have right wing yep. left wing kind of thing and it it, yeah. it always galls me and it was a, that is a that's when i fell in love with this film it's like wow you do yep. not get cringe you know upper east side asshole is no like but no, my point no. is is that she is really touched though when he starts explaining like uh shit happens that's why my life changed here and that incredible oh. realistic car accident always kills me the first time i saw the best one of the best car was, it, it was it's incredible. like one of the most memorable chilling. scenes and it's like 12 seconds it's like oh, barely shit. a yeah no totally yeah. and then it keeps going and the teeth are gone and like like dribbles coming out of his bloody dribbles coming out of his mouth he's like trying to look and he's saying like that is my dead wife or somebody in my family with you know being covered up and and then he says you know non he then he goes like and that's why i don't have the teeth and then it's like yeah are you liking this now people in the upper <laughs> east side like that's why he doesn't have teeth you know and like uh, you know his wife divorces him divorces him which is such a weird thought like um like yeah oh you're out of your coma I'm filing papers. You're yeah. Reversing. You know, and it's just yeah, like, yeah. so anyway, I'm just saying, and then she's really touched me. You know, Streep does an incredible performance. Yep. 
And uh, it's, it's just, I always find that very touching uh, that there's a real human connection made when there would be this otherwise a big ca cultural chasm. So that's all I'm saying. So to the point, I'm just saying, like Marcus's point, is that this is a far cry from like a Gondry or everywhere yes. all at once horseshit, well, horseshit visuals. It's like wow. that's people acting people, you yeah. know, as real people. Well, and and that, 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 that makes it for me in this film. You know, it's mm -hmm. not as broad as the Donald and everything, but mm -hmm. it, it's beautifully and, done. I think it's like somewhat interesting that uh, I, I, you know, there's an interview with Susan Orlean and she discusses seeing the movie and realizing that Charlie Kaufman had pulled out her own relationship turmoil mm -hmm. at that time. She got divorced a year later. And so Ch Kaufman was reading into the orchid thief, mm -hmm. her longing her attraction to this man probably making that even more pronounced if it's it, it wasn't uh, as explicit in her writing you're saying i don't know if it was or not but like okay. cert it was probably more pronounced but certainly what charlie did bring was like that if she is this attracted to this guy in the novel there's an imbalance at home and she ends up in real life getting divorced mm, from her first wow. husband well, that, that was donald's observation right he's like whatever it was was yeah. not in the book yes yep. yes that's right. Yeah. Well, yeah. you're right you're right you're right, you're right. Yeah. and yeah. on that note totally. um on that note because i wanted to go back to one thing that that marcus brought up earlier or maybe mm -hmm. it was joe i can't even remember now um uh, was the <laughs> was uh, the idea of pe the, the people's reaction to this screenplay? You know, yes. because it yes. was it, it wasn't like you know like you were saying he didn't go around and and ask permission to do this or he didn't get everyone's okay. <laughs> like he didn't go to the executive, he didn't go to the you know other people and get you know, his agent or whatever get their you know reactions. He just wrote it, and um, it's I love thinking and or imagining. God, I wish I was a fly in the wall for when any of these people picked up this script and started reading yeah. it, and and were like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> yeah. um, for example, I know that the executive in who's you know played by uh, Tilda Swinton, she opens up the uh, or like like when when her when, when her real life proxy is reading the script, mm. she's like, "I'm ten pages in," and suddenly realize, "Oh my God, I'm in this," you know, <laughs> which is right, which right, is right. which is amazing. And so then um, that's great. That's and great. then of course, and then of course, Susan, when Susan Orlean is you know uh, reading this, imagine. she's like, oh, page one. Wait a minute. There's dialogue from. It's opening with Charlie Kaufman. Like, isn't that the guy who's <laughs> writing the script? <laughs> yeah. And then she keeps reading, and then of course her jaw hits. She's the reading fucking, that. She, well, she's reading that eventually she winds up on top of Charlie. Exactly. Yeah, I know. I know. A couple know, times. I know, I I'm know. still surprised she okayed the, this film. I you know, know. I know. But she, no, but she, literally, she said, I thought in an interview where she's like, I kept reading, and then I got to the part where I or I appear on a porn site, and I was like, wait a minute, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, actually, I'm I'm glad you 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 brought up the well, unless you guys wanted to comment on that, but you you brought up the scene with um w with her on top of charlie and it sort of reminds me too of just this moment um in the movie which i think maybe if you guys want to talk about just kind of the meaning of this movie or what you know the movie is saying because it's saying a lot i think it's, it says a lot about yeah, you know in sure. the sections about you know f in, the, in the sections about it it's kind of ironic because it does succeed in sections about being about flowers, you know, like he's trying to make mm -hmm. a movie that's just about flowers. Yeah. And I think that speaks to the power of Spike Jones in this, where he's actually created some really visually beautiful montage sequences that are undercut with Susan Orlean's prose. With her great writing, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and it's so her, he, and her insights yeah. Yeah. about and, like sort of the sexuality of the, the flora and everything. Yeah, mm -hmm. like and like both like they're reading yeah. uh, Meryl reading it, you know, re uh, when yeah. she reads, you know, she reads yeah. those lines so well when she's, when she's the voice of the almost like NPR voice. Chris Cooper something. though too yeah. is has a nice soliloquy about like, you know, it's like you let your heart guide you like, you know, these plants, you know, these flowers know that, you know, that these bees got or whatever the hell that, you know, is happening. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, they, they both um, you know, he, he in his own way and she in her own way are are are, are relaying some of this uh, these poetic insights, yeah, about and how I, nature works, and it's beautiful and stuff. And then they yeah, the complementary images, and and yeah, it's it's just it's just great so that great. like in in the struggle that Charlie had to 
make a movie about flowers that he at least gets to achieve a few scenes that he wanted yeah. to. Yeah, good point. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a, there's a, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because there's a part where he's like, he's talking to his agent who's so funny, Ron Livingston. He's like so mm. funny in this movie. But, it's great. Um, Classic. Uh, you know, he's like talking to him and he's like, you know, I just wanted to, I didn't want to make a big Hollywood movie. I wanted it to be about flowers. I wanted to sh- show people how amazing there are. And his agent's like, are they amazing? Yeah. He's like, <laughs> I, inch- think, I think so. You Charlie's know? like, yeah. And, you know. And then there, there are a few moments where it shows orchids and like the evolutionary process that how they've adapted to the world, you know. Yeah, it's but then in the last frame of the movie, the last shot of the movie is Charlie showing us and Spike showing us that flowers are amazing. We see that flower grow up in front of the screen mm-hmm. and, and then the the sun and the moon, you know, mm-hmm. whatever the daylight changes, and the, and the mm-hmm. way the flower waves and moves with that sort of stop motion, stop thing. frame, yeah. yeah, yeah, that is like them showing us, like, yes, flowers are amazing, you know. This, mm-hmm. um, but are yeah, also I love a metaphor that it succeeds on that level you know, too, because but it, then also it's a continual metaphor uh, for interpersonal relationships, and they get into that, Marilyn, uh, yeah, Chris Cooper, you know. Yeah, and so, about. so and she, you know, she's, you know, he's, he's just like adaptation man because he's always ad- adapting. Like, I think I'm doing porn now. I think, yeah, you know, I, think I know I'm the internet. On. You know, so yeah. he's, yeah. So, but she's like, yeah. you know, you know, flowers don't have memories. You know, so all that those moments are so great. I really love mm-hmm. them together. In that yeah, film. It's so great. Um, well, well, sorry, one more thing uh, before we just move on from this because the, the the reason I brought all that up is there is one of these great sections of Meryl Streep uh, narrating that I think is really, I don't know, it just really stuck out at me that this one line um, about, you know, that she says in the film, and I actually wrote it down here. She says, um, and I really think this is what the movie is about. Uh, She says, uh, there are too many ideas and things and people, too many directions to go. I was starting to believe the reason it matters to care passionately about something is that it whittles the world down to a more manageable size. And it's a beautiful line, beautifully written, perfectly yeah. rendered in this movie. But then, of course, and this is what makes this movie amazing, is you have a beautiful <laughs> scene like that. And then, of course, cut to Charlie Kaufman jerking off to her photo in the leaf jacket of the Desperate book. book or whatever. Again, keep <laughs> mind. For the third time. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> the guy who wrote that is depicting himself doing that. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. The There's balls. so much masturbation. There's, it's, it's so much uh, masturbation. It's always, it's always funny, though. It's like it's never, yeah, I'm I don't saying, know, yeah. the, the way that Spike did it, it's yeah. like it's always funny. It's always yeah. service, you know, a yeah, purpose. Yeah, that's like, said, not, that room is feels mad too depressing, though. I don't know. It's, it's, it's funny, but it's also like there's like no lighting. There's nothing on the walls. It's like dude. no furniture. Comforter, well, yeah. there's also an extreme contrast <laughs> with clothes. Charlie. If you just look at Charlie and Donnie's like writing stations, like Charlie is writing with his typewriter <laughs> on another chair and a small oh, work light. That. And then fucking hunched over Donald it. is in yeah. like has all of his like gear he has a hermit like ikea chair as i'm like wearing ikea right, as i'm oh, on right now shit. Okay. he has all yeah he's got his whole setup is like neat and perfect and it's just like a funny I did not notice that i noticed the hunched over like i should get a muffin you know that little yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How? he's yeah. like uh yeah no so it's just the yeah. way he's living is uh, the way charlie's living is is uh it's depressed it's so yeah. it's like depressing single male hell you know oh yeah mm-hmm. no he furniture shots like they, they shot yeah. it so beautifully his bedroom is it's just well, like the I, last place in the world you want to be. Yeah. You know, I, I, I read a great interview with Lance uh, Ackard, who was the DP on this and also shot a lot of other Spike Jones stuff and being John yeah. Malkovich. And a couple of interesting things that um, I paid attention to there was like the idea that the house was something that his agent told him to buy, to buy as like a write off. So it's like very like it's not very well furnished. He's sleeping mm. on a on a suit on a sofa on like a futon and like mm-hmm. you know it's it's supposed to give the element like he doesn't even give a shit about his house, which yeah. didn't, again is not a home. A, it's you not a home. It's not very it's loving. Very echoey in his house. Yeah, like, exa- yeah no, exactly. You can hear there's no furniture in there. <laughs> and yeah, I think amazing. like a, a, a bigger Shadowy. aspect of it that I, I visually, I uh, absolutely adore this movie. I think it's probably one of the greatest shot films of it modern times. Beautiful. Like it's kind of a great sheet sheet. And I've always wondered why it works so well. And, <clears throat> I, and then Lance Ackard 
talked about how there was 300 scenes in this movie. And wow. so they wanted a lot of rhythmic flexibility, shot by shot, scene mm. by scene. So they got rid of most establishing shots or most tricky, like very fancy mm. camera work. And they just did things dead on, kind of more mm. straightforward. You know, they picked a couple of moments maybe, but more or less the scene was, the, all the scenes and shots were done in a way to be very modular and to like really rework in the edit. And I think like mm -hmm. the whole movie has like this great, un like kind of uniformity to it, despite the kind of the wackadoodle kind of mm -hmm. premise that we're dealing with here, right? Which kind of is like what we were talking about at the beginning, like the movie's so elegant, stately made. And, you know, that's partially Spike Jones is like directorial. Yeah. Uh, decisions there and yeah. also uh, the rest of the crew like Lance it is yeah, really shout well. out to I, the I restraint the general restraint yeah. on a fantastical I, topic yeah absolutely yeah. yeah I feel like I love it is shot well but it's not in your face I think that's so no, important. Never. and that and that comedy doesn't really w usually work when it, to be hyper stylized either you know mm. like yep. it's yeah. like a kind of it's a very rule French thumb, but yeah. How how yeah, awesome yeah, is it? Just <laughs> quick <Shut> weird laundry. <laughs> weird oh, there God. You go. <laughs> yeah. Quick quick like weird bad thing European it's, aesthetics. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh that just popped into my head just talking about the empty space and you know, Charlie and Donald is like I love that the introduction of Donald and other key Donald moments are him on the floor. <laughs> Like I, I, I just, I, I, that's just such a great little well, subtle the furniture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Back that's the out. thing. Yeah. When you're hanging out in Charlie's room, it's like, there's yeah. the floor. Yeah. You know? right. <laughs> or the futon. Right. Yeah. Right. So, um, it's just, it's just incredible. And I, I mean, I, and I know we've talked about it, you know, a little bit already, but I just want to give a little more airtime to the three, to the actual idea of writing this convoluted serial killer film. And I, I just love, when a when a sort of cheapo hack idea you know for a movie is used in a greater artistic context you know right. like like and and sopranos it, i you took the words out of my fucking mouth oh, i was sorry. just okay. about to You're say right. no it's okay, okay. Sorry. i was sorry. i was i was just about to say that like the 3 is so um Clever. So Cleaver core, it, like it's yeah, not even totally. It's so yeah, Cleaver. Same director, probably. Chuck yeah, Donald, probably. probably. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah totally. Yeah. So amazing. I just, I just love I, that. I, but. I think about that line all the time when Charlie's like criticizing it, you know, and he's like, you know, because he's like, um, uh, he's like, you, well, he's criticizing Donald's script, saying like, the only thing more, you know, that more ever used is, uh, you know, multiple personalities. But he's like, you explore the notion that cop and criminal are two sides of the same person. <laughs> yeah. See every cop movie ever made for other examples of this. Yeah. He says yeah. with exasperation, staring, uh, uh, you right. know, at the wall. You know, actually, <laughs> you to Trojan horse this kind of transgression against the very industry that is paying him, and they have a, it's a twenty million dollar movie. You know, it's like it's again because of its subtlety and elegance. Yeah. It doesn't get thought of as such a radical movie, you know, like, but it, it fucking is, you know, yeah, it's, yeah, it's calling it shots. It's, it, you know, Can I just we talk about it actually that. it's cultural context for a moment because, yeah, you know, this is um, actually I got a little sad watching adaptation, you know, all these years later, we're talking about like, you know, what, how does it feel now 20 years later? And I'm a little saddened by it because, you yeah. know, they made movies like Adaptation then, and it, in a way it wasn't remarkable. You know, it was exactly. a follow-up to a big hit, you know, a big mm -hmm. art house hit, uh, being John Malkovich, and a cultural sensation. And, you know, the Oscars and stuff like that were involved. And, like, uh, I'm like, where are we now exactly? And uh, we've lost a lot of the infrastructure where a film like that could happen and, and thrive. And I was just thinking, and I almost want to give a shout-out to Magnolia, Ironically, and all, I was, all I want to say about oh, hold on my point because it's the same era and it's the same kind of neighborhood of things, even though Magnolia sucks. But what I'm saying is there's there's um, <laughs> there's some continuity for me, like like films, indie little art house indie films like this, like these two films would have a moment where there's an interlude where there's uh, some kind of maybe like literary narration momentarily, which is interesting. Uh, and then there would be, um, you know, like a, a historical uh, um, um, depiction, you know, a, 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 re a reenactment. And to be brief, you know, like there's a scene in this film where like, uh, you know, it's showing like the history of like orchid hunting or whatever. But my point is, is it, it felt like the typical indie art house film felt like the world was very big creatively and literally and I, I feel like the the, the mumble core post mumble core period feels to me very claustrophobic it feels very people talking in a kitchen 
and then you're mm-hmm. done. And these films don't have really huge budgets, bigger than maybe a typical modern indie film, but maybe not that much more. But there was so much imagination in, in on every level in the script writing, but then also like you know just um, the editing. And and that was my tiny shout out to Magnolia. Just like I'm missing indie films that felt kind of big. Do you guys know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah you know, oh, yeah. Yeah. Conceptually but, big. I mean, like yeah. the other modern thing that I bemoan that I have to squeeze this in here is like, sure. you know, like looking into everything. It's like the the way that Charlie Kaufman, I think, has been absorbed into the culture as like like Hollywood is in a way, from my estimation, has in many ways like kind of like absorbed him in as their scapegoat. Like, look, we support artistic filmmaking. Like the most of the, like most of the modern, ironically enough, most of the modern screenwriting books will tackle a Charlie Kaufman book mm. to say, look, everything has its structure. Oh, throwing and so bone. they're sort of missing the point that it's Charlie and Donald here, you know, and they, they seem to <laughs> have found a way to, somewhat commercialized the idea of Charlie Kaufman, like most kind of somewhat, you know, relevant industry types will like kind of champion Charlie Kaufman because they can kind of defend him as, as being a cred kind of, yeah. You know, and like, if you go on YouTube, you'll find thousands of 10 screenwriting tips for Charlie Kaufman, you know, and it's just kind of funny that they're kind of, yeah, the commodification, the idea that we have to crack the code of Charlie Kaufman and we're going right. to make these video essays about cracking the code of all of his movies. It's like you guys are missing the, the, point, the, yeah. the, the I brilliance. Hate that, right? my, my least well, favorite word on YouTube is explained. Yeah, yeah. 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 it becomes like part Lost of that Highway culture. explained. <laughs> Totally, totally. Like, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm glad you mentioned that because that's, that's yeah. just a really, that's what a dumb person does when they look at something like this film or Lost Highway, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah Explained. Totally. Anyway. Well, yeah. And they don't really even let, like they let Charlie Kaufman in a little bit, but they only let one Charlie Kaufman in. David Lynch exactly. too. It's like there's only yeah. one David Lynch yeah. that they let yeah. in. They, everyone right. loves them. Everyone it's loves tokenism. those guys, but the, the, yes, exactly. Token, um, yeah, totally. You know. Yeah. So one of the things, like about yeah, just to, uh, one of the things that's enjoyable about this movie I mentioned earlier was like it's it it works on multiple watches through, you know. And I think I mentioned earlier, like I didn't get it the first time, and like so. But the second time you watch it, it's more, uh, you know, I was young or whatever. But the second time you watch it, it's like you you see him laying the foundation. You you appreciate it on another level, you know. And then the third time through, it becomes like comfort food or whatever. But you know, I actually saw an interview with him where he was talking about how, uh, with Coffin, where he was talking about how he actually thinks about how it, the film is going to play on multiple viewings, you know, which I think is so oh, really? refreshing to hear that someone is actually baking that. It's not just an accident that it, that it is, you know, that yeah. it's re- more rewarding. And that, that reminds me of Lynch too, with like Mulholland Drive or something where like, mm. it is, it takes more than one viewing to sort of like, really appreciate the movie. And, I mean, does that happen very much anymore? I don't. Right. You know, I, know I can't mean. think of another movie recently that well that yeah. is rewatchable. Yeah. Well, you you were saying like you know it's like th- this era you know there was that boom period of those middle tier budgeted films you know indie films yeah. right and they were being recognized everywhere and it is it's just it's dead you know that is a dead well, art it's long gone. Mm-hmm. You, know? you have imagine the, the, the worst thing about Hollywood being like a movie like the three. You know, you know yeah, like, I know. I mean, that I would know. be fantastic if that was our biggest worry. I know. Was I know. That the movie oh, like I see what that? you're saying. Yeah, no, totally. Out? Yeah, Jesus. true. Yeah, I know. What Jesus, you mean. Yeah. <laughs> fucking Christ. And the set. Yeah, I'm. It's, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm. I'm squarely on what happened. How Mumblecore was processed, like the takeaway from Mumblecore. Well, there were some. There were some okay films. It seemed to diverge in both extremes, you know, like the indie world, yeah, went very reductionist, like mm-hmm. mumblecore, and then movies, as I think everyone was mentioning, you know, have just been well. The, the whole middle is zany or Marvel. No, but what I'm yeah. saying is, like, I think within mumblecore, there is like, um, uh, it just feels like cinematically lazy, like even like a Noah Baumbach or something like the Myers Brothers or whatever, Meyerowitz Brothers or something. It's like, um. It just feels, I swear, I just get sick of indie, quote unquote, films just feeling like people talking in a kitchen. Yeah, it's just, yeah, yeah I'm yeah. repeating myself. I'm sorry. But it just, I know it's just mean. the scope, the scope. And it's yeah. not budget. Everyone kind of like associates like if you no. leave the kitchen, you've got to have a huge budget. It's like just do other fucking stuff. Play with yeah. everything. It's ideas. Oh, 
you know what? Yeah, though? I was just going to say from the beginning, it, it, yeah. the creation of the story to to the editing, yeah. like yeah. like like have a more dynamic cinematic experience in the making, yeah. and we'll have one. And yeah. that really was flourishing right here, two thousand two, with the film like this. All I'm going to say is, be careful what you wish for, because on the other side <laughs> of that coin, we also yeah. have the eighty million dollar you know uh, cosplay auteurs that we've uh, talked about a lot oh, on well, this they, uh, uh, okay. show so and, and you know yeah so yeah, we do have that so it's a, there is a danger uh, to this but anyway oh as talent a, sorry that's yeah, one talent. Last everybody yeah, needs right. to have some talent yeah yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> I forget talent. um yeah and and speaking of that it's it's literally like you know brian cox why should i waste my fucking time watching that movie <laughs> you know um it is that but we you should talk a little Robert bit about McKee's, him. uh uh, he 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 demanded. I don't know how much he demanded it, but he was like, "I'll I'll do it, but you have to get Brian Cox to play right. me." Oh, <laughs> really? He looks. He's a dead yeah. ringer, or Perfect. vice versa. Like they because he didn't want to be a goofball. He wanted to have some dignity. Uh, if yeah. he was gonna if he was gonna get pantsed, he wanted it to be fucking Brian Cox. Yeah. Wait, Real quick, Brian Cox killed so it. So good. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Hannibal Lecter. Brian killed it. Best even Hannibal just Lecter. even the scene at the oh, bar, yeah. you know, amazing scene. Yeah, yeah. It's I mean, incredible everyone scene. has, everyone's given their dignity, right? I mean, you're talking about that yeah. with Chris Cooper. It's like there's yeah. not a character in there. Like the person that you would think he would take pot shots on the most is Robert right. McKee, and he learned something from from that. Not issue. at all. Right. There totally. The reason this movie is great is because he incorporates, uh, you know, some of Robert McKee's. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, that's but, the thing. You know. Well, guys, we're running out of time. Can we maybe know. address the structure of the film and we're calling it Tom's trouble with the third act. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I want to uh -oh, hear from you guys. I'm not going to get yes, boring yes, and get into my issues with it, but um, what, what are your guys' take on it? This is my one sentence thing is Okay, yes, in the narrative of this film, the way things yeah. are going, mm -hmm. we're going to wind up in the last act and have a, Mc a McKee influenced mm -hmm. action film with drugs McKeean. and guns and alligators. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, for me, I, I, that that felt like that was disappointing to me because I loved so much of the first and second act, and it was and I get bored and restless because also I think it's a not very interesting genre of film. Suddenly, in the third act, I'm not really engaged in it that much. And then inside that that disappoints me is I don't quite un maybe I'm a dumb person and I'm shallow. I don't understand Charlie's soliloquy at the end about like, that's my love, you know, and that has nothing to do with the person I love. I, I mean, I, it, I, I like it in isolation. Yeah, as a yeah. monologue but i'm not under it comes out of nowhere for me in in this character that's other otherwise completely cripplingly neurotic i don't quite get him talking to donald about love that way and and her saying i want to be a baby again it was like where did those come from they feel a little forced and artificial that's all i'm gonna say joey so, take it okay all right so that scene particularly i mean i could i could pray on my knees to that scene <laughs> like like okay. to be like also to write that i mean it's fine to have that reaction because i think no, but that I reaction, like the writing that's what i'm saying yeah, yeah. But the context well, to me I, I guess context i i i feel like what he's learning somewhat there is that this character donald that he thought was so superficial was just so, sort of like had no clue of his own stupidity right um is actually quite well aware and has you know and he's sort of his his whole life is sort of being reframed around this idea of being able to like find some kind of self-acceptance. Like the way that we talked about that, how Charlie and Donald are reflections of, of each other. If he's finding this wisdom through his brother, he's in some way experiencing, I think some form of self-acceptance and so many of the themes like okay. Evan pointed out obsession and, and longing and passion. Like these ideas are so hinged upon this outside object. And, and so and Donald, that, is saying, yeah. okay. Donald is saying, Donald is saying, it's not about that. It's not that that thing that you're coveting that you want so much from the you ghost know, orchid or a girl. Fish. Yeah, the ghost orchid, all the girl. It's not about that. It's about what you're bringing in and what well, you okay. there's care two about. Things. That's enough. Anyway, there's also sports, but well, I no, but, it, oh, but yes. I, I think I the reason that, that it's too, well, I know, I know. Let me just quickly get you into it. You hit it. I, oh, I also think the reason it feels forced is because I do think and I don't want to just lazily say that it's part of the meta thing but it sort of is yeah, I, I would figure, because they yeah. because they had that whole argument about how the characters have to learn something you know and, and, he, life and he was yeah, and he was yeah. pushing it he was pushing back on that like how they don't but i but i do think sure. that there is a message Overcoming in there obstacles to succeed in the end <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. but but yep, but yep. but 
but I do think there is something to gain from that because you know he his his own Charlie's own cynicism is getting in his own way. You know about yeah, about definitely. about everything in order to unlock this you know script. You know, and I think that okay. um, yep. finding. Some wisdom, as you said, Joey, in 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 what he was saying, it, it is a little basic. Um, mm-hmm. I will give it that, and I also will say that I do sort of agree with the alligator scene being iffy. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, that is probably Here, the right. loosest part. But go ahead, go ahead. I but Just I do like the drugs real quick. Love the drugs oh, and the love sex. The drug. Drugs okay. and the sex. All right. We got to get into the Keep drugs and the sex. But just to say this, I think this is maybe you'll agree with this, maybe you won't. But I think the way that it feels kind of ham fisted, I mean, you can make the point, oh, it's a meta commentary. Right. It's, it's not supposed to work. And I think there's right. some validity there. But to me, it does work because I think what he's actually trying to do is he's trying to throw away these things that we think movies are about. We think that this scene's supposed to be really exciting. But what it really is about are these internal Mm. conflicts of these characters and in that way it's consistent and so i think he's meaning to throw it away not maybe to make a meta commentary like oh it's supposed to be bad it's donald's third act but i think it i think at a more genuine level i think he's sort of trying to make those scenes not not be that sexy not be that thrilling because it's not about the plot it's about what's going on with these people i don't know about that it's a little clumsy and i think it's yeah i think it's belabored by like a little too long i think a half hour is it uh, it kind of is spinning in its own wheels, kind sure, of. Sure, sure. Real know. quick, though, as far as, developing, the, as far as developing the elegance of having the two kind of incorporate and speak to each other, you know, I, right, I just we, feel like I'm watching a bad movie all of a sudden. Marcus. We know we got to hit the drug scene. Sorry, we got to hit the, the dial okay. tone scene. Can we? Oh, my I, God. I, I, oh yeah, yeah. Really you one of the. That, Marcus? That, yeah. Dial tone? That, go just for hit it, it quick. It's amazing. I love that insight. Uh, I think it's a really, um, it feels like a really profound moment, even though it's like a drug thing with you where you're, you're becoming really entranced by something that's very everyday. But I love mm-hmm. that it makes me think about how the phone dial tone is actually a chord and not a single note, you know, and, yes. um, it's and I love the sync, uh, how them doing it together and you need two people mm-hmm. to do it. And beautiful. then they, the audio effect they put on it, but it's got that Brilliant. kind of like, whoa, 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 whoa. it's got kind of like mm-hmm. a phaser on it or something at the end. And so it's like what, about that moment is so good. And it feels so real, like a like real a, trip. Um, yeah. Well, back yeah. to what well, we're saying it, too. It, it's yeah. Funny it's that, grounded yeah, it's in a reality. Metaphor, it's yeah. a metaphor for that kind of connection that the main character needs. He needs to make mm-hmm. that dial tone with, okay. with Donald. So right. it's funny that we're landing on this last scene because in some ways, it is kind of proving the thing that the main character will eventually get to. It's also yeah. one of the most, it also sums up the aesthetic virtuosity of the movie because it's a drug scene. We've all seen plenty of those, but this one's the most like kind of subtle, grounded. straightforward, and also right. grounded and the most convincing. I authentic. Say, one of the most convincing. And, and, and again, we strange. are living in, to Thomas' point, I guess we actually are in the like McKee world at that point. You know, like mm-hmm. that's a really well executed scene that is about a, the movie has already become a drug heist movie at that point, you know, but it's right. really mm-hmm. well executed compared to like the alligator scene later. See, that's know, a good but. bound. The alligator, I'm not so sure, but that scene with the dial tone is a good example of that fusion of things. But I, I do see, but that's I like the this. beginning of this. So no, it's no, like I an escalation. And, 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 and you know? I like what you're saying about how the dial tones are, are co- complementing each other. Donald yeah. dial tone and Charlie dial yeah. tone are complementing each other by the end. I just think it's a little clumsy. Something's wrong for me. I don't know if something's missing or like, I think it's actually pacing <laughs> is a little weird. Maybe. I think it got paced <laughs> Could a little quicker. sloggy. Could have been quicker. Maybe quicker. It's a little sloggy. Yeah. yeah. That might be yeah. part of my yeah. problem. I, mean, maybe they, I think they have to go big and make it kind of dumb, make it extra <laughs> dumb so people get it. Oh, oh shit. Yeah. There she is. There it is. Girl. Right. Old school <laughs> episode two homegirl. Okay. All Marcus. right, we gotta we gotta no, shut up now. Time, unfortunately, dude. we're out. Oh. <laughs> oh my god, this is this is my least favorite hour. Uh, the clock, I mean, because like I was oh like, okay, god. and 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 I hate it. <laughs> and it, and it's one. too slow. And it's too slow. Oh. And it's a little slow for me. <laughs> we're out of time. <laughs> god damn it! Wow, that was brutal. I know we could have. I thought we were gonna have enough to say. Honestly, no, you know, I didn't. no. Well, we have four people. To, at we least, just got started. Yeah. Very least. We just got started. We covered so many good. Damn. I think we covered yeah. a nice for array. I know? agree. Nice one. Yeah. You know, I think you've helped me there, Joey. On 
All right. I told you it wouldn't shading. convince you, but you know, no, accept fine. it on offer. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> we have, but there's some. No, there's some, the, the dial tone actually got me. The Charlie mm. and Donald Downs. Anyway, we're cheating. All right, I, I, well, I have, I, I have some regrets, but it's okay. Um, we, we did manage to get a lot in. We were fighting. This is what the, yeah. the show is. This is the hour. You got to get it in. You got to get your it's shit I in. I hear this is a great gimmick, by the way. Mm, oh, <laughs> hey, I'm I heard glad someone you... recently say what? that that having a one hour limit is a great gimmick. Quote well, unquote. let me, let me, let me shout that out because I'm glad you brought that up. I want to shout out. Uh, our, our our friends over at the New Beverly Podcast, Pure Cinema Pod, who shouted us out. Um, uh, yep. Thanks for that. Uh, they were big fans of the BJ Lang Presents episode <laughs> of One Fucking Hour. And who is it? That's amazing. Yeah. It's taking yeah. it's it's taking the nation by storm. <laughs> yeah. So it's, so now that was great. Five, uh, six people that like that movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Of course, they're the ones to grab onto that one. Though. Yes. Well, of course. <laughs> uh, thanks for the shout out, guys. That's cool. Yeah. Thank it's you so awesome. much. And um, yeah, thank you to everybody who's been checking out the show. And obviously, if you're listening to this and you're not subscribed, please. Please take a second to subscribe on the YouTube channel or on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts or whatever. Follow us on Insta or on Twitter. That'd be awesome. Uh, so that's the best way to support the show uh, for now until we launch launch that Patreon we've been talking about, um, which we'll, I'm sure, get Ooh. to at some point soon. Um, but anyway, Joey, thanks so much, man, for coming on yeah, to Duke to it have out. You. Duke thanks it out over uh, yeah. <laughs> head rotation. Anytime. Absolute pleasure. Yeah. We'll have to yeah. do it Thank again. You, I mean, oh, yeah. some movie. Some hour, we'll figure it out. But yeah, we can't wait <laughs> yeah. to have you back, man. Good Fantastic. stuff. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, all right, let's talk about next week real quick. Um, so next week, we're going to have another special guest on the show. We're going to do something a little different. Um, uh, I'm, I'm glad you guys are going to indulge me on this. I feel like it's a birthday cheat almost to be doing this. Um, <laughs> but um, it's not my birthday. But we are we are going to do something that's a little out of your guys' comfort zone, which I think will be fun, is yeah. um, we are going to cover... Well, first, we're, we're going to have a special guest. Um, his name is Sam Roberts uh, of uh, Tom. He's of uh, Opie and Anthony <laughs> fame. Uh, well, Sam Roberts... Well, it's uh, Jim Norton and Sam Roberts, you know, daily podcast is you know yeah uh, a classic thing but uh yeah sam was an intern at opie and anthony and he mm -hmm. was you know like all interns on that show he got you know he got very meta and he got inside the show and this right. intern would comment and you know uh, get on the mic he got a lot of mic time and he's a classic you know he's a classic sam's great right and i didn't know uh, you know i i listened to all episodes of the show and i didn't know that you were personal friends with him because you had your wrestling thing with him that's what i'm gonna say yeah so me so, so Sam and I are big wrestling fans. Uh, in our professional life, we do a lot of stuff related to wrestling. You know, I make documentaries about wrestling. He's on TV from time to time um, and has a podcast about wrestling. So, um, so we thought it would be fun on this show for one fucking hour to do uh, an episode on wrestling with shadows. Okay, which is the uh, CBC. Um, or no, sorry. It is the National Film Board of Canada's documentary um, about Brent the Hitman Hart exiting the WWF in 1997 under, shall we say, some shady ass circumstances. Oh. Um, and uh, it's it an NFB. Yeah, it is. It is. Mm -hmm. So it's an NF NFB doc about Brett the Hitman Hart, and it's the best era of '90s wrestling. It's all the backstage intrigue. It's Sounds cool. It's, okay. it's literally like one of the most pivotal moments in wrestling that made people 10 times more interested in what was happening backstage than what was happening uh, in the ring. So we're doing we a say. doc. If you, if we broaden yeah. this, we're covering a doc and yeah. it happens to be a topic that you and your guest, Sam, um, you know, oh, yeah. uh, you're, you're well versed in it and I'm not, I don't know anything. Wait, what's I it called again? You know, wrestling with shadows. I thought it was beyond the mat. Yeah, you didn't get the memo. We're flipping the script because I'll tell you why. We, different we actually, wrestling movie, a different di indulgent wrestling. We're doing movie. two. Okay. We're doing next well, week. We're doing Beyond the Mat. Well, let me let me let me Hard explain choice. this. Let me explain <laughs> this. You, you well, you were 15 minutes late to the recording session. So okay. no. So what happened is um, there are there are <laughs> there are two pivotal wrestling uh, docs, like two pivotal elevated wrestling docs from the from the 90s. One is Beyond the Mat. One is Wrestling with Shadows. Sam wants to come on the show to do both eventually. We will do both. Um, we picked Wrestling with Shadows because it's just 
been remastered in 4K and came out this week. So, uh, or the week that we're recording this. So, the time okay. is right to visit Wrestling with yeah, Shadows. They're both equally, <laughs> they're they're equally awesome. Well, we will eventually okay. cover both um, to kind of bring together our wrestling audience with the one fucking hour crew. Yeah, because just yeah. simply stated, like Evan, like uh, it's a it's a huge topic for you. Uh, you've had this successful show about the world of wrestling, which I yeah. find very, very, really objectively very entertaining. I still know nothing. I know I know nothing about wrestling before and after I watch every episode. I don't know anything about it. <laughs> I don't know if I'd ever. I don't care. I like. I don't care. Like I'm not against it, but I'm like I yeah. just. I'm totally ambivalent. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. You you have found a way to make it engaging for someone like me, you know. Uh, and uh, yeah, there's some wild characters and some wild stories, and it's human drama. And again, like all I'm trying to say is. I guess we're doing another doc, you know, and you exactly, know, simple, exactly, simple, exactly. Way, this is you know. what's great about Beyond the Mat and Wrestling with Shadows is they're both docs that work for someone who doesn't give a shit about wrestling. They're yeah. great storytelling. It's cool. a, it's a wacky stories, and it's and it's NFB man, that National Film Board of Canada. You know, uh, you know, they're not I love that. Yeah, you know, they're not fucking around. You know, when they're making a doc, no, so. Um, sure. So anyway, <clears throat> so we will check that out next week. One fucking hour on Wrestling with Shadows with special guest Sam Roberts. Um, so look uh, forward to that. And then, of course, Joey, thank you again. And uh, we can't leave anybody out uh, without their moment of zen. And I'm excited oh. for... <laughs> I know. It feels so good. It's great don't to it? hear that again. Yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah. So <laughs> all right, everybody. Have a great West. Have a great rest of your week i can't say that and um we will talk to you soon uh for our next episode all right everybody take care uh see you later bye bye, bye. did you have a full understanding of exactly how non-linear and how much of a non-adaptation of your book <laughs> this script was going to be i went home i started flipping through the script and i thought who is charlie kaufman isn't that the guy who wrote the movie and and then i continued flipping through until i got to the scene, I'll never forget this, where I appear on a porn site. And I thought, wait a minute, hang on a minute. I called the next day and I said, um, you know, I, I can't let you make this movie. I said, I, it's gonna ruin my career. If you really insist on making this film, you're gonna have to change my name. He said, "Why?" And I said, "Because it's it makes me look so bad. I mean, I'm I'm sleeping with my subject. I'm a drug addict. I'm." And he said, "Well, Susan, look look at Charlie. He's masturbating through the whole movie." <laughs> Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. <laughs>